Pushkin. About a year ago, I got my hands on this novel, unpublished, but apparently based on a true story. It was written by this guy, Ned Timmons. The overarching plot was pure pulp. I mean, you could imagine the movie starring Steven Seagal and definitely straight to video. It tells the story of a newbie FBI agent named Ned from Detroit who grows a Fu Manchu mustache, goes undercover in a violent outlaw biker gang, and infiltrates a secret syndicate that's smuggling hundreds of thousands of pounds of pot into the country. And all that leads, eventually, to the invasion of a foreign country and the arrest of a brutal dictator. Skeptical? Yeah, so was I. See, I'm a journalist, and my specialty, if you can even call it that, is stories that seem too crazy to be true, stories that are on the verge of urban legend. Most of them turn out to be bullshit, which doesn't bother me. That's kind of the crux of my job, actually, sorting through the bullshit. So, naturally, I had to go meet this guy. One, two, one, two. Tell me, tell me where we are. Your office, like, describe where we are. We're in uh, Commerce Township, Michigan. Yeah, give me a little bit more than that. How long have you had your office here? 18 years. Ned is now in his early 70s, walks with a limp. He's bald, but you wouldn't know it because he likes to wear a weather-beaten camo hat. Nowadays, he's a private eye. His office is beige in a beige corporate park. Totally forgettable. Except for the bear. It's the first thing you see when you walk up. A 10-foot brown bear, taxidermied in the classic rearing-up-to-eat-you pose. Ned tells me he got the bear on a hunting trip in Alaska. But the real trophy? That Ned keeps in a plastic bag in his desk. Yeah, this is a bag with bear penises and wolf teeth. And the Inuits believe that that will protect you. The bear has a bone in his penis. And I recovered these. Like after you shot the bear, you... Not before I shot it. <laughs> Nobody's going to take a bear dick when he's alive. The Inuits would make a necklace out of this to protect him. I just keep it in a bag because I'm going to wear a bear penis necklace around the office. Do you, do you believe in it? I mean, do you believe in the, like, its power of keeping you safe? Yeah, I do. I believe in it. I've been all over the Arctic and lived two weeks at 40 below zero and and uh, all over Russia and, you know, where, where there's nothing. And I just keep a bear penis with me. I think there's something out there that maybe it's only in your mind. If it's in your mind and it works, um, I don't know. I'm still here and have had many, many close calls. So here I am. Right. So, at first read, Ned's unpublished novel seemed like a classic airport potboiler. Typical cloak and dagger, ex-cop kind of stuff. Like, when the hero heads out on a case, it reads, A quick shower and a breakfast of Alka-Seltzer and aspirin had Ned feeling three-quarters human again. That voice is the actor Walton Goggins. We asked him to read from Ned's novel. And in this novel, there are some great characters, like the drug-addicted pig. And this pig, he guards a drug lab while munching on onions soaked in meth. The novel tells us, The dark and well-bristled pig was eyeing them with the disturbing, calculating look that pigs give. Many of the details in the novel, like the pig, were so quirky and distinctive, they felt like they had to be true. Other scenes seemed contrived, pure Hollywood. I kind of felt like I'd gotten myself a guidebook that was about half accurate. There was a true story in here, a real piece of history, if I could just, you know, extract it. Yeah, easier said than done. I started making a to-do list, like I was going to the grocery store or something, only mine went something like this. One, reach out to your contact at the FBI, make sure Ned's not a kook. Two, call the CIA. Yeah. Like they'll tell you anything. Three, visit the guy who smuggled 300,000 pounds of pot into the US in a single shipment. Supposedly now lives in Hawaii. 
Four, track down that long lost mistress who's living somewhere in South America. Shit. All of a sudden, the story felt like one of those 5,000 piece puzzles that my kids like to open up on vacation and just spill across the floor. And then you see a corner piece and a matching edge piece and damned if they don't fit. And then, well, there goes your vacation. I'm Jake Halpern, and this is Deep Cover. Episode one, The Masked Man. All that I really remembered about the drug wars of the 1980s was there was this huge problem that the government was trying to fix with slogans. You might remember, just say no. That was the battle cry of President Reagan and his wife, Nancy, distributed all the way down to our teachers in high school. I remember these lectures and thinking even then that they were an idiotic remedy to the drug war. I even wrote an op-ed in my student newspaper just say no, K-N-O-W, to just say no. Corny, I know, I was 14. A little slogan was not going to kill the demand for an entire drug market. And it sure as hell wasn't going to stem the flow of marijuana that was pouring into the country. And you kind of had to wonder, where was all that marijuana coming from anyway? And how was it getting in? Historians are still debating this question. You can find reams of conspiracy theories, like it was the CIA behind all the drug smuggling. Yeah, that's still a hot one. In fact, the CIA will eventually figure into this story, along with celebrities, politicians, heads of state. But we're getting ahead of ourselves now, because this story really starts in Detroit with Ned Timmons at a rowdy roadside biker bar. The bar was a roadhouse out in the sticks. The dirt parking lot was full, mostly with motorcycles, nearly all of them Harley Davidsons. Those are the opening words of Ned's novel and where we'll begin our story. It's the early 1980s. Ned Timmons is in his mid thirties and early in his career at the FBI. He's working fugitives, just basically going down a checklist and rounding up wanted men. This was not a desk job. It was an assignment for guys who wanted some action. As Ned tells it, he got a tip about a fugitive who was supposed to be at this biker bar on the outskirts of Detroit. So Ned grabs his jean jacket and his 357 Smith & Wesson and heads out. There were some mean motherfuckers in there. You know, there, there was a hard ass, hardcore biker bar. They're doing shots and drugs, and it was a scene out of a movie. <laughs> or a novel. In fact, here it is in Ned's novel. A single sodium street light out on the far edge of the parking lot shone down on a payphone. From that lonely pool of light, the darkness of the parking lot reached out a good 25 yards before the glow of neon beer signs signaled the borders of another America. This was the lawless America. This was the rebel yell. This was easy money, fast bikes, and girls that were easier and faster than both. Nowadays, it's hard to appreciate just how right our novelist is about the lawlessness of biker bars in the 80s. Today, we might think of these guys as old gray beards who putter around on three-wheeled Harleys, but not back then. These were dangerous men drugging, partying, and fighting. Here's Ned the novelist again. The smell was the first thing that hit. Old beer, piss, B.O., reefer smoke, and puke. The second thing to hit was a cover charge, two bucks, and the guy demanding it was the size of a freezer. Bikers seemed to come in one of only two sizes, big and really fucking big. Probably smells like 
sweat and beer and and Jack Daniels all mixed up together all the time. That's Kathy Timmons, also an FBI agent in the Detroit office, and Ned's wife at the time. She remembers going to one of these biker bars with Ned on another night, just to serve as cover. You know, his actual wife pretending to be his girlfriend. And then if people actually need to breathe, they go outside because the smoke in the bar would be just that thick that even a smoker couldn't tolerate it, you know? I mean, people, you know, there'd be a fight going on over here and everybody else over here is just sitting and talking. Other people are shooting pool. Just chaos. On this particular night, Ned says he was looking for a fugitive named Toby Anderson. Toby had quite a rap sheet, apparently. Toby's file was about six inches deep and a lot of real violent stuff, you know, selling guns down in Kentucky. And, and, uh, you know, this guy was a career criminal. He also happened to be a country western singer, and his band supposedly had a gig that night. This was one of their hits. Snitches and ripoffs must die. Snitches and ripoffs must die. I've been called a sucker, but I'll kill the next motherfucker that tries to steal something of mine. As Ned tells it, the bar was crowded with outlaw bikers. Ned knew that walking in here as a plainclothes agent was extremely dangerous. Everything was about the brotherhood, the code, your fellow bikers, even the music. So Ned had his eyes on the band, looking at the singer. He knew that Toby was supposed to make an appearance on stage tonight, but could it be that the lead singer of this band, the guy up on stage right now, was his guy? There's a lot of good people sitting in jails because some punk told the pigs what they've done. Well, we could end all of that if we took our ball bats, start killing the snitches for fun. So Ned says he saunters up to the bar, takes a seat on a stool, and just waits for his partner to show up. It wasn't his regular partner, just a guy providing backup that particular night. In the novel, Ned describes him as a blue-blooded preppy who arrives at this biker bar dressed in penny loafers and a tie. The two of them watch the stage together, trying to find their fugitive figure out just who Toby was. All they had was one flimsy clue, a picture that was six or seven years out of date. There wasn't really any mark scars or tattoos, which is nice if the, you know, the guy's got a swastika on his cheek or something. There was nothing we could look at other identifiers. We just, we weren't sure. Ned waited for the band to take a break. Then he went to suss things out. I followed him in the bathroom and, um, you know, was taking a piss beside him. And I said, hey, aren't you Toby Anderson? And he goes, nah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I was down in the Keys with Toby, and I swear you're Toby. And he just kind of, no, man, you got the wrong guy. And uh, I said, don't, don't you remember so-and-so's boat on Big Pine Key? Uh, we partied down there. And he, he was yeah, okay, I'm Toby, you know, what the fuck's it to you? So ah, we just, you know, had a good time that night. I reach out to shake hands with him, and I and I get his hand, and I'm shaking hands with him. And I just lean up to his ear and say, Toby, FBI. And uh, he goes, fuck you, and he starts to swing. Okay, let's freeze frame right there in mid-punch, because this is not exactly textbook arrest protocol. I mean, there are other ways to handle this, like waiting until Toby headed out to the parking lot or even just following him home. But this is the first thing you need to understand about Ned. And it's also the first thing that Kathy ever knew about him, going back to when they first met as small town cops. If, if somebody was in a foot chase, you know, you, you might, you know, oh, we got his ID, we got his car, you know, we can pick him up tomorrow, whatever. Ned would chase that guy down until he got him. She tells this story about Ned before they even started dating. Ned knew where her family would be celebrating St. Patrick's Day, so he just showed up and blended right in as if he were some long-lost cousin, chatted up her dad, got along famously with everyone. Most people don't have that level of confidence to be able to just walk in and, and just 
immediately become a part of the crowd. So cornering Toby in a bathroom, aggressive, a bit reckless, classic Ned. Okay, back to the biker bar. And I just lean up to his ear and say, Toby, FBI. And uh, he goes, fuck you. And he starts to swing. And right then, Ned's partner comes into the bathroom. We kind of overwhelmed him. So we get him in cuffs. We were going through the bar and everybody's starting to realize he's in handcuffs and he's like their superstar and people are pushing and shoving. And Ned says he and his partner frog marched Toby through a bar of drunk bikers and out the front door. I had Toby on the hood of the Bronco and he's still wrestling around, but he's handcuffed behind himself, behind his back. So we had Toby. I actually can't be sure if this story at the bar is 100% true. I talked to Ned's partner from that day, and he didn't remember it. I talked to another biker who knew Toby very well, and he remembered hearing some version of this story at the time. Unfortunately, I can't ask Toby himself since he died back in 2004. But I did track down Toby's son, who gave me at least a better sense of who this guy was. I remember riding the motorcycles with him, with me on the back. He was just kind of reckless and dangerous. I was screaming, holding on for dear life, right? And he just thought it was funny. Today, Jesse Anderson is an executive in the auto industry. Back when he was a kid, he got a real close view of all the madness and chaos that his father was in. I was afraid of my dad. Everybody was afraid of my dad. So yeah, he, he, was, he, he was reckless. Which is what everyone said. The friend of Toby's told me that Toby would cut you or even shoot you without hesitation. And this gave Toby street cred. In the criminal world, he was the real deal, which appealed to Ned. When we come back, Ned interrogates Toby, the prisoner. Look at Toby, you're fucked, okay? You've, been, you've done time in seven fucking federal pens. This time you're going back for life for a long time. So what do you want to do? These days it's harder than ever to lead a happier life. But I've found that if you really want to find happiness, you should look for answers in evidence-based science. I'm Dr. Lori Santos, a professor at Yale University. In my podcast, The Happiness Lab, I discuss how the latest research on the science of well-being can change the way you think about happiness. We tackle topics like how to deal with loneliness and how you too can get over your complaining. You can find The Happiness Lab wherever you listen to your podcasts. Snitches and repulse must die. Snitches and repulse must die. It should be a sin to squeal on a friend. So I think all snitches should die. This is Toby Anderson singing one of his hit songs with the legendary chorus, Snitches and Ripoffs Must Die. Ned Timmons still remembers going to question Toby. He brought him breakfast. Pancakes. And he ate them with his hands. <laughs> he had syrup all over his face and all over his fingers and probably hadn't eaten in a day or so. Yeah, you could see he was just, I mean, he was just like totally burned out and weak. Now, he didn't have all his buddies that were going to help him. So look at Toby. You're fucked, okay? You've, been, you've done time in seven fucking federal pens. This time you're going back for life for a long time. So what do you want to do? We spent several hours with him, you know, and finally he says, well, there's probably a couple of things I can do. So they started working together. Toby knew better than anyone the dangers of working for Ned, of becoming an informant for the FBI. They had to be careful. Ned says they spread a rumor that the charges against Toby were dropped because no one wanted to testify against him. This story would keep any of his biker buddies from thinking that he'd flipped. Even while cooperating, Toby tried to maintain his own kind of biker ethics. He would not rat out friends or members of his own gang, but he willingly betrayed his enemies. So he and Ned would find a target, for example, a drug house. We'd set up undercover surveillance, sent him in there, and, uh, 
you know, we had vans and, and different stuff with, with high-tech cameras and stuff that were on periscopes. Just a little periscope comes out of the top of the van. Oh, the good old days when the drug dealers didn't know what every TV writer knew. Unmarked vans with periscopes meant trouble. So then we'd develop a raid plan and get a search warrant and kick in the doors. All the way up to the 1970s, the Bureau wasn't really focused on drug suppliers. That had been the job of the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA. Now, the DEA did have some big investigations, but they were mostly one-off busts. You know, they'd seize the drugs, lay them out on the table, big photo op, busted, end of story. But by the early 80s, this approach wasn't cutting it anymore. President Reagan's attorney general empowered the FBI to get involved in the drug wars. After all, the Bureau were the ones taking down the mob. Something big had to be behind all of this. The feeling was, this couldn't be just a bunch of local mom and pop drug dealers. Here's what the attorney general, William French Smith said at the time, quote, the popular notion that the syndicate or traditional organized crime stays out of drugs is simply not true. Many of the syndicate's families have developed elaborate drug networks. Virtually every one of them is involved in drugs in one way or another, end quote. But that's not all. Smith also told Americans precisely who was distributing all the drugs for the syndicates. Quote, over the past decade, some 800 outlaw motorcycle gangs have developed around the country and in foreign countries, and drugs represent their primary source of revenue. The strategies of the Attorney General and Ned Timmons had what you might call synergy. As Ned saw it, Toby was his way in and up the ladder. So the FBI came up with a plan. Ned would go undercover and become a biker. Ned's wife, Kathy, remembers how quickly things changed. I didn't like that he, of course, started growing his hair out and, and he had a Fu Manchu mustache. And it, when we would go out, we'd always, people would look at us and we'd get seated like way at the back of a restaurant, you know, like, like we were creepy. The mustache was just the beginning. Ned knew he needed to up his skills as a biker. So, like any good FBI agent, he went to school. The Ontario Provincial Police Motorcycle School. Ned says he learned to ride his bike upstairs and lay the bike down at high speeds. I rode a bike a lot for the FBI. And you're very vulnerable. And after you've been through the school, you realize just how dangerous a motorcycle is. After graduation, Ned went back to Detroit. He created a new persona and carefully chose a new name, Ed Thomas. Because you wanted something that was close to Ned. A couple times I was undercover in an airport and old college buddies, I ran into them and they're going, hey, Ned. And <laughs> it's an awkward situation if you're with a bunch of bikers. Ned Timmons, Ed Thomas. It was close enough that you could stumble through it. Ed Thomas, a badass biker with money and connections. If you wanted the chemicals to make meth, Ed Thomas is your guy. And the ruse worked. Ed helped the FBI take down other outlaw bikers. On at least one occasion, Ned told me that they cuffed him as well at the arrest, made sure it looked like he really was a criminal. The FBI wanted to protect his cover because Ned, he was really good at this. You know who was not so good at this whole undercover thing? Toby. Ned's wingman, Toby, was still living the biker life, and increasingly, there were problems. Like the time that Toby was out at a bar and watching another band play. The lead singer was playing this fancy and very pricey Les Paul electric guitar, and Toby liked it a lot. What happened next is kind of a legend. I heard it from a few different people, including another biker who was there that night at the bar. So out of nowhere, Toby screamed, FBI, at the top of his lungs, whipped out his gun and started shooting. He snatched the guitar and bolts out of the bar, like he deputized himself as an FBI agent or something, and then totally went rogue. 
And for a while, he got away with it. Toby now has this sweet Les Paul electric guitar. And right away, he started touring his local haunts with it. Not a worry in the world. Because that's Toby. And because it's Toby, that's not the end of the story. A few weeks later, Toby's performing up on stage, and he gets shot. Now, we don't know who did it for sure, but everyone I spoke to said it had to be the guy he robbed and stole the guitar from a few weeks earlier. So Toby, he's shot and bleeding out on stage. Across town, it's bedtime at Ned's house when the phone rings. And I get a call again, like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, says, you better get down to this bar. Uh, Toby's been shot. And so I race down. It's like a 45-minute drive. He's still laying on the floor in the bar, shot. So I get there and say, look, it, you got to go to the fucking hospital. He says, okay, I'll go now if you go with me. I got a call from somebody in my family to say that my dad has been shot and that it was, uh, that it was pretty severe. That's Jesse Anderson again, Toby's son. And that day, the day his dad got shot, it's always stayed with him. On the way to um, the hospital, they got stopped by a train and he almost bled out in the ambulance because the train was so long. And at this time, I now think I'm, I, I think I'm about 12 years old. But again, for me to hear that my dad was shot, it's, like going to the store. I mean, it's, this stuff happened all the time. Something like this happened all the time. Toby recovered from being shot and just kind of carried on. Now, as crazy as that sounds, this was normal life for the Anderson household. In fact, hearing Jesse talk about his dad like this, it helped me understand what life was like in Toby's world. Mayhem just seemed to follow this guy everywhere. Everything was topsy-turvy. Even jumping in the car to pick up a pizza became an event. All I remember is pulling up to a stoplight and up in front of us is a guy mugging another guy. And my dad's like, well, I'm not gonna stand for this. Puts the car in park, sets his beer up on top of the roof, gets out, beats the living crap out of the guy who was mugging the other one, stole all of the money that he had, split it with the other guy, got back in the car with me, grabbed his beer, and just drive down and, you know, son, looks like we got some dinner money or something like that. And just, no big deal. Didn't say another word. That's my dad. A little vigilante justice, that was a good night. But it could get darker with Toby, a whole lot darker. When we come back, Ned wades deeper into Toby's world. He had that dark look. You you know what I'm talking about, yeah. That crazy look in your eyes that you think, this guy is a psychotic person. I better not push his button. (laughs) Ned's wife, Kathy, met Toby on a number of occasions. I remember telling Ned that he resembled to me Charles Manson. And Kathy knew the telltale signs of a dangerous guy. At the FBI, she worked street gangs in Flint, Michigan. Toby didn't aspire to anything other than the moment. When people only aspire to, you know, how am I going to get out of here in the next 15 minutes? And they don't care. They don't think consequence. They don't think of any of that. Gang kids are like that. They they just do in the moment what they have to do. And and if it means killing you, (laughs) they'll think about that later. So why did Ned just walk away from him? Let him go back to prison. Move on. Because Toby was, yeah, definitely dangerous, but also kind of like a dead end. I mean, he wasn't some kind of kingpin or even a trusted lieutenant. He was just a violent and unpredictable guy. But Ned, he just had a hunch. He felt that by slipping deeper and deeper into Toby's world, somewhere along the way, 
there'd be a payoff. And because he was spending so much time with bikers, Ned kept hearing chatter. Well, I had sources up in northern Michigan, bikers, and they would talk about, okay, there's a shipment in or whatever. The bikers would get their supply of weed when when these big shipments would come in, you know, which is 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds or whatever would come into the Detroit warehouse. If such a warehouse really existed, it was the El Dorado of drug houses and confirmed what the attorney general had said, that elaborate drug networks lay behind all the small drug busts that had been happening. So Ned goes and tells his bosses. There's this huge deal out there and it, and it involves shrimp boats and barges and airplanes. And so I told my bosses about it, you know, and they kind of said, well, yeah, yeah, we're, you know, right, Tim is what he's smoking. Around the same time, Ned says he arrested another biker and tried to flip him, just like he'd done with Toby. Only it didn't work. In fact, during the arrest, the guy just taunted Ned. He says, well, he says, you're missing the boat on one of the biggest fucking deals going out there. You don't even know it's under your own nose. But he, he, t- he alluded to this massive deal where there's hundreds of thousands of pounds of weed and coke coming in. And then basically said, fuck you. And that was the end. He wasn't going to cooperate. In. For Ned, this intel was just too enticing. His bosses might have been skeptical, but Ned stuck with it, kept hanging with Toby. It's just I knew he was out with them all the time. I just, until I would hear from him, I would many, many times just sit there and think, oh my God, something's happened. And then he'd call and then I'd be relieved and then I'd be mad because because of all the stress and the worry. And it wasn't just Ned's safety that concerned her. Will you hang around that long with a bunch of bad guys and, and fitting in with them? Your behavior is going to change and your, your, um, your own personal bars, you know, where you draw the line, changes. This would be the first, but not the last time, that Kathy was right to worry about her husband and where he was drawing the line, especially when it came to Toby. You know, I was supposed to meet him or whatever, and I um, went down to the house on my motorcycle and pulled up in the yard and put down the kickstand and walked in, and there's a dead guy laying there in a pool of blood. And I go, Toby, what the fuck? And he goes, bruz, masked man. Came through the door, shot this guy, I guess he didn't like him, and ran. That's all I know. A masked man? Come on, Really? This was Toby's story. A strange guy wearing a mask breaks into his apartment, shoots this guy who's currently lying on the floor, and then runs away, leaving Toby to take the rap? I mean, this has got to be the homicidal equivalent of the dog ate my homework. I later asked Toby's son about it, whether his dad was the kind of person who was capable of committing murder. It pains me to say it, but... um... I don't, I don't blink when I, when I say, you know, could he have done it? Did he do it? Has he done it? I'm sure the answer is yes to all of them. Um, and and I, don't, I don't think twice about it. Ned didn't tell Kathy about this whole episode with the masked man and the dead body. Oddly enough, he seemed to take the whole episode in stride. So, in, in a way, if you're 100% certain it was Toby that killed him, it was just a technicality that you weren't there to witness it. I'm not a witness. I'm not in charge of collecting evidence. I'm not, uh, FBI doesn't investigate homicides. It wasn't my job to investigate a homicide. Just don't kill somebody in front of me. That's it? Yeah, pretty much. Ned says that he did call the police. And so when Detroit police came, they told him the same story, and they didn't really give a shit. You know, it was just some shithead biker. Ned now had his line in the sand. The trick was keeping Toby on this side of it. But you, you don't make progress and you, unless you're dealing with sociopathic, homicidal, crazy people. That's who are in the inner circle of, of drugs, violence, and whatever. So this is just part of the deal? It's part of the deal, yeah. So... 
What are you saying to him in that situation? You know, I just told him it would be advantageous not to continue to have bodies laying around in your house or in your yard. And I said, tell the fucking masked man to stay away. After listening to Ned's story, you know, in the shadow of his 10-foot stuffed bear, I still just didn't know what to make of it. When I got home, I reread his novel. Ned and his ghostwriter were giving me everything they thought I wanted, with all the film noir settings and Raymond Chandler dialogue. In the novel, Toby's like that two-dimensional villain depicted on a target at a shooting range. You know, lone bad guy with a gun drawn. But what struck me most was what was missing from the novel. There's no mention of Jesse, the son, or what it's like to grow up with Toby as your dad. And Ned's wife and colleague, Kathy, she doesn't even make a single appearance in the novel. I guess her Midwestern accent and by-the-book thinking didn't fit into the hard-boiled narrative. It became clear to me that the truth, if I could extract it, was way better. But this wasn't gonna be easy. Honestly, I didn't know if I could fully trust all of Ned's memories. Part of the problem was time. All of this happened 35 years ago. I mean, memories fade. And then those same memories had been taken off the shelf and reworked into fiction. But I was all in. And so for the last year and a half, I've been trying to put all the pieces together. I've been to dive bars and horse farms, to backwater swamps and pirate museums. I've poured through FBI reports and court transcripts. This story is taking me to North Carolina, Maryland, Florida, Michigan, Hawaii, and the Cayman Islands. I've talked to agents from the FBI, the DEA, and U.S. Customs, to U.S. attorneys, pilots, ex-girlfriends, Detroit felons, and a bunch of big-time drug smugglers. And all of this to find out whether a rookie agent from Detroit could really make a random bust in a biker bar one night and set off a cascade of events. The discovery of a gigantic drug warehouse, the collapse of a nationwide smuggling ring, a war in Central America, and the overthrow of a brutal dictator. Next time on Deep Cover. You know, you don't have to choose that path. You don't have to choose to work a case in that way. You don't have to choose to go deep cover, you know, but I know for him, he felt like it was just spinning into the next, into the next, into the next. And, and he told me that he felt like he didn't know how he was ever going to get out of it. Deep Cover is produced by Jacob Smith and edited by Karen Chikurji. Our story editor is Jack Hitt. Original music and our theme was composed by Luis Guerra, and Flawn Williams is our engineer. Fact-checking by Amy Gaines. Mia Lobel is Pushkin's executive producer. Ned's novel is read by Walton Goggins. Special thanks to Julia Barton, Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Lital Malad, Maya Koenig, Eric Sandler, Maggie Taylor, Khadija Holland, Zoe Gwen, and Jacob Weisberg at Pushkin Industries. Special thanks also to Jeff Singer at Stowaway Entertainment. I'm Jake Halpern.